session. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming out here tonight and listening to such a, a, an important topic. And also I wanted to let you know that if you have not signed up, if you're not a mainstream member, make sure you sign up at the back of the room. We do have emails that go out now and again that keep you apprised of what's going on in Topeka. My understanding that is that in the state of the state address that the governor just gave or is still giving, uh, one of the things he said was that he wanted to change the voting dates uh, from the spring to the fall. So they'll all take place in one, uh, one time and these gentlemen, some of them can, and ladies, can talk about some of that information, tell you why that's important and why that's happening. So, um, and then I guess there was another one, a couple of bills that were introduced by um, Chris Kobach, we all know him, and they were talking about, he was, his bills are about um, being able to just check if you are a D or an R, and then all the rest of the uh, ballot will be R only or D only, so you could be a very lazy voter and just vote straight ticket, make money to make that easier. So those are a couple of things that are new just today, and uh, I'm sure you'll have questions for these gentlemen. Right now I want to introduce uh, the MC for tonight, that's Harry McDonald. He is co-president of the Mainstream PAC. So let's welcome Harry and all our guests. Thank you. Well, uh, I reiterate Cheryl's uh, welcome to everyone, and um, I want to uh, introduce our panelists, and then I'll explain the uh, format for tonight. Um, starting at the far end, um, from the uh, Outreach and Community at Liaison Director for El Centro, we have Ave Negrete. Let's welcome Ave. And then next to her, we have Bruce Newby, who's the Wyandotte County Election Commissioner. And next there is Brian Newby, the Johnson County Election Commissioner. And a special welcome to uh, Micah Kubik, who is the new Executive Director of the ACLU Kansas and has uh, been serving in that capacity for a total of nine days. <laughs> so for tonight, we're, uh, with four panelists, we're gonna ask each panelist to uh, comment on various things about elections, election turnout, um, and, and voting, uh, encouraging more voting, that deal with their particular uh, organizations uh, and issues. My name is Valdea and I work for El Centro and uh, part of what we did at El Centro in these past elections was ensure that our clients and the people that came into the organization had a chance to register to vote. Um, and we also did some um, outreach and some canvassing to ensure that uh, people in or neighborhoods had a chance to register. Um, a little bit about Latinos in Kansas, um, I wanted to start with that, which is uh, the Latino bloc here in Kansas, I don't know if you guys heard about this during the past elections, but, or the amount of people that could register to vote that were Latino was bigger than the difference between the candidates. So we really had a chance to make a difference in this uh, past elections, and um, the number of voters was also growing. However, out of the 11% um, of Kansas is Latino, out of those 11%, only 6% are registered to vote. Um, that can be for many reasons. Some of them might not be legible. Some of them might be too young. Uh, we're a very young population. We're a population that if we become citizens, we have to establish a culture of voting. Because really, it's, uh, uh, voting is, is it's a habit. And until you do it about three times, you won't really remember to do it. So. Uh, it's uh, it's more difficult, I guess, sometimes to get those Latinos out and registered and voting. However, in this past election, we made up also 6% of the people who, according to NBC, Latinos made up 6% of the people who actually voted. So since we 
so six percent of the population that's eligible to vote is Latino. Like six percent of eligible of Latinos are voters. Uh, no, six percent of the population uh, are Latinos. Well, well, well. <laughs> we make up six percent of the eligible voters. Six percent voted. That's what I meant. Sorry about that. Let's start over. <laughs> Um, so we really turned out at the same rate as everyone else. Uh, here in Kansas, uh, between 2000 and 2010, we have grown significantly. We grew by 59% and we continue to grow rapidly. So even though we might not all be registered to vote, and even though we really uh, were underrepresented when it comes to people that are registered, we're growing and we're becoming citizens, and since we're young, we're also becoming eligible voters. And we're making a even bigger uh, voter block here in the state. Um, the, and I wanted to talk to you also, so now that we have kind of the numbers and the fact that we, we really voted kind of at the same rate, but we are underrepresented because we're not all registered, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my experience at El Centro and what we went through when we were registering voters. We uh, were one of the few organizations that went out and used, uh, used resources in order to register uh, people who might have not been because it was very difficult. The resources that we used this year to register voters would have gone a lot farther had we registered voters in any other year because there were so many steps that we had to take in order to register someone. Uh, here, uh, in, we did at our office, and we also went to precincts in Johnson and Wyandotte County that had a high concentration of Latinos. Uh, when we went door to door, even, even though it was difficult for everyone, I think, every single one of our volunteers, because, we, because imagine somebody knocks at your door, and then they ask, you want to register to vote, and they ask you for your birth certificate, and they ask you for your ID. It's a lot, and the community in general is cautious about that kind of information. So I think it was difficult for volunteers to be able to ask for that or ask them to send that to the elections office. And it was also difficult for people who were at the door, because that's a lot of information that you have to send in. That's private. So, um, I think the biggest voter, voter block that had a difficult time with the small sample that we had in those high Latino density precincts uh, was, which my sample is pretty small by the way because it was hard to register voters this year, um, was women. So Latinos, I think if they were young it was harder because they didn't, had never voted before and they had all the roadblocks that everyone else had but women were the ones that um, I had to call back a lot more because we had to follow up with people if they hadn't if they if they hadn't submitted the rest of the documentation. So before I turned in the application, I'd call them and remind them, well, this is all the things that you have to turn in, otherwise they're not going to be fully registered. And uh, most of them were women, and some of them had issues with changing names, with not finding their marriage certificate with uh, with being having been divorced and having changed their name repetitive times. So I think that really was, in my experience, the part that I had the hardest time with. Um, and uh, I think that's my time. So I am good. Thank you. <laughs> This will go quick because there is a lot of ground to cover. I was asked to address five questions, and if I have five minutes, that's one question a minute. So you do the math. <laughs> uh, I was asked to address how we are managing the new voter rules. By that, I assumed, it because it wasn't specified, that that meant voter ID and proof of citizenship. Voter ID. Voter ID went into effect three years ago, and it was pretty much a seamless change in Wyandotte County because most people were already accustomed to offering us their voter ID or an ID of some kind when they came to vote. And they were many people were surprised when they when we didn't want it. Beginning in January 2012, we started, it became a requirement 
and, but we haven't had any significant problems of the implementation of that. We, in fact, have a 99.994 compliance rate with the voter ID requirements in Wyandotte County. It's pretty significant. You find any other law where there's that high of a compliance. Uh, voters and election workers both adapted very quickly. The proof of citizenship for voter, voter registration. Most applications come in with the proof. However, there are some that do not have. So what do we do with that? First thing we do is we immediately send a letter to that applicant, say your voter registration application is incomplete because it does not include your proof of citizenship. So we solicit that immediately. If we do not hear from that voter within 30 days, we send them a, re a reminder in 30 days. Before the run up to the elections last year, one of the things that I had my staff do is monthly, we were sending reminders to voters for whom we did not have their proof of citizenship to come make it right so that we could help to make sure that they were able to vote. We didn't have anybody that came to us and said, I don't have the proof of citizenship that I need, what do I do? I wish we had, because I know there were some people that probably should have been able to vote and didn't just because they didn't bring us their documentation. Um, okay, second one. What is the impact of new voter rules on voter turnout? Well, as I said, with a 99.9994 compliance rate, we really haven't had any issues uh, that I believe impact uh, voter turnout. The proof of citizenship, I quite frankly from the statistics cannot infer an impact from the numbers. And that's because as of November 2014, Incomplete applications in Wyandotte County constitute just 1.6% of all registered voters. 1.6%. Voter turnout, I've been tracking it since 1996. There are no significant variances when comparing similar, similar elections. In other words, if you compare a presidential election to a presidential election, they have stayed about the same in terms of the percent turnout. It's the same thing with the midterm elections, the same thing with mayoral elections, and the same thing with the spring elections that we have this year where the mayor is not on the ballot. The numbers tend to remain the same. To me, the main issue is the number, the very large number of registered voters who don't vote at all. Don't vote. In November 2014, 64.6% .6 of the registered voters in Wyandotte County chose not to vote. That's problematic, I believe. If we're going to have a democracy, it has to be participatory. If people abandon participation in democracy, I'm not sure what the future of our country is. Um, by comparison, in no November 2010, 61% did not vote. It's a big number when you're looking at, at the total number of rules. What are the new voter rules accomplishing? Well, for Wyandotte County, voter ID accomplishes for us, our voter check-in is substantially faster and more efficient. We use electronic poll books in Wyandotte County. And all we have to do is scan the barcode that's on the driver's license or on the state ID. Uh, proof of citizenship simply ensures that those who claim this to be citizens in fact are. The last question, since I'm down under a minute, what happened in the November election? How many people had problems voting? We have a 35.4% turnout. Compare that to 39.4% in 2010, and a 39.3% percent turnout in 2006. Yes, there's a difference of 4%, but the thing that I heard over and over and over again that was that from Wyandotte County voters is that there was a lot of people that were distressed that there was not a Democratic candidate on the ballot, and they refused to vote for that reason. Um, there are expanded, I expanded voting opportunities in 2014. I added a satellite location west. We have also offered evening hours and weekend hours, which we hadn't done in Wyandotte County before. Um, provisional ballots, real quick, there were 740 provisional ballots cast. Put in the context of the total number of ballots cast, that represents 2.5% of all ballots cast. 2.5%. Of the provisional ballots that were cast, 71% of them counted. Counted. Only 29% did not count, or 214. The, uh, and this reflects a constant statistic over the last 20 years. And I believe that finishes my time.
First of all, the disclaimer, Brian Newby is not related to Bruce Newby, although we both laugh that that's a funny coincidence. <laughs> Second of all, how many of you are election workers? Some of you are Johnson or Wyatt County? A few of you. You are the heroes, so I think you deserve applause. Thank you. It is very hard to be an election worker, and I've been using some of my time just to make sure that you're uh, know that how much you appreciate it. Now, normally when we talk, we have five minutes, and it would be good to have a point. I regret I will not. Um, but I do want to point out this that I handed out, and this is really what I would say is maybe mood music for some discussion that we'll have. So not knowing, as Bruce said, what we'd be talking about, I wanted to just cover a few things, just get you kind of thinking about some of the issues we're facing. So really, I'm just going to go through some thoughts about elections we've had in the last 10 years. Why 10 years? That's how long I've been election commissioner, so it seemed like a good time to make that measure. And then also get into uh, special elections, talk about that just briefly in turnout. And then I saw there was some element of discussion about provisionals, and I'm only going to have some element of discussion about those. So this is just kind of a real rapid fire thing, but first, if you flip through that, there is the obligatory uh, breakdown of how people are registered in Johnson County. You may just want to refer to that. That's only the reason it's there. Uh, we have about 366,000 registered voters in Johnson County. Now, one thing I wanted to point out, just to first start this, some of you, probably all of you who are from Johnson County know right now that we have mail ballot elections in nearly every school district. January 27th, they're all due. 330,000 ballots were sent out. This is now one of the largest elections if you combine them in Johnson County history. So our participation is going to be what I would say is November-ish, when we're all said that, probably 155,000 people voting. And if you look at the top of the second page, this page, it shows the largest elections in terms of voters in that 10-year period that I mentioned. And then even go, I want to point out a couple other things. First of all, we'll come back to it, but this election that we're into right now, January 27th mail ballot, is going to be in the top six or seven of all elections in that 10-year period in terms of number of people participating. So it's a big deal. It is the largest election on paper that we've ever handled. But I, instead, I want to hone you into this uh, chart at the bottom where I've circled the fall general for 14, 2006, and 2010. You see the number of ballots counted, and you see also that the voter turnout in 2014 was identical to the voter turnout in 2010. Now, I'm not here tonight, or any night really, to either praise or trash any laws that some of you may have strong feelings about, um, but I do want to point out the numbers there suggest things are about the same. And we just heard from Bruce that things are about the same there, too. So that's just one data point to suggest that the turnout like elections, is about the same as it was before. Now, if you flip on, though, the next page, just to quickly show you, we've already had 63,000 ballots on those returned from this mail ballot election. So we're already at a 19% turnout, just in case you wonder. And it's already the seventh largest election in that 10-year period. How many have we had in that 10-year period? 61. Actually, 66, if we count all five of these. And so it will be sixth when all said and done in that 10-year period. Now, it's a special election, and I thought it was good. I heard Cheryl mention early on about the movement, perhaps, to have elections go from the fall or from the spring to the fall. We have opinions about that in our office. But there's one question uh, that comes up a lot is why would you do that? And our thought is, my thought is, if you move the uh, spring elections in the fall years to the fall, pardon me, spring elections in the odd years, to the fall in the odd years. Get everybody used to voting every November. Get the schools to get on board and have a school holiday where we can use every school as a polling place. People will be used to voting. We won't move polling places around. And I believe over time, if everybody's used to voting every November, turnout will go up. And the argument back is, how can you say that? How do you know that? Well, we don't, of course. But if this chart that has these little two little red arrows and a green arrow, the point of all this is we looked at all the mail ballot elections in this last 10-year period. We looked at special elections in the last 10-year period. And the turnout, the lowest turnout, reflected by those red arrows, is still higher than the highest turnout in the last four spring elections. So while we don't know 
that November elections would have a higher turnout, we can pretty well be certain we will have a higher turnout any other time in April. And to me, that is an important point, and one that we, I will advocate why we should have it in November, so just a point of view. The last kind of thing here uh, is discussion about provisionals. And you can see the provisional ballots from November 14 and November 10. We had more provisionals in November 14, but we used to take those that, uh, from the people who voted by mail, and they didn't fill out their address. The law required that we not count those. We got an attorney general opinion, and we're able to count those. And so while the number did go up, you can see that the number counted actually in 14 went up as well. The number of not counted actually was slightly lower in 14 than in 10. So the number one reason why they're not counted, as you see in the far right, is that the voter isn't rich. And so that might also be a data point in support uh, of why some of these laws are a little restrictive. So again, I'm not trying to go either way. Last thing is, I have updates all the time on uh, elections. Electiondiary.com is a blog. And I'll talk to you all soon. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Micah Kubik, uh, and I am with the ACLU of Kansas, and I'm very happy uh, to be here with you this evening. Uh, so as difficult as it may be to believe, particularly in these uh, very politically tense times, uh, the ACLU is neither left nor right, uh, but we exist solely in order to protect and strengthen the fundamental freedoms and democratic processes that are guaranteed to us by the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and one area that is certainly under attack in terms of our constitutional freedoms and democratic processes today is in the area of voting rights. And make no mistake about it, my friends, but Kansas is certainly on the front lines of that struggle. Uh, you know, we are very concerned about the constitutionality of some of the provisions of the new voter registration law. Uh, because, you know, it, it wasn't always this way, but now the right to vote is something that is guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, we have something called equal uh, treatment under the law, right? One man, one vote. And it's true that voting is a right, not a privilege. But unfortunately, it seems like there are some people active today who really believe that voting ought to be a privilege and not a right and that we ought to put up as many obstacles and impediments to allowing people to register and vote as possible. And in our view, that's unconstitutional, it's un-American, and it's just plain wrong. Now, one of the things that we know about the new voter registration law is that it requires you not only to prove who you are, but also that you are a citizen. And that sounds like a pretty easy thing to do until you start to think about all of the time and expense and bureaucratic error that can go into finding those documents that you need in order to be able to prove your citizenship. We hear horror stories all over the country of folks who have been on the voter rolls for 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and all of a sudden, now when laws like the one that has been adopted here in Kansas are implemented, suddenly they're tossed off the rolls because they can't find their birth certificate that was issued in 1911 and the county registrar can't find it either. It's a real problem. The other thing we know is that the folks who are most likely to find it difficult to produce those documents, the folks who are most likely to find it difficult to register to vote and thus participate in the process, are folks who are already the folks who are most marginalized by our society. Folks who are members of racial and ethnic minorities, who are economically disadvantaged, who are senior citizens. Those are the folks who are most impacted by laws like this, and that concerns us on constitutional grounds. Now, the other thing that really bothers us right now about the voter registration law is that uh, you know, there, are, there are steps that our country has taken to make it easier to vote. And one of those is a national law, a national voter registration form, which by federal law, every jurisdiction in the country is required to accept. Required. It's not, it's not optional. Required to accept it. Now, in practice, not very many people use the national form. They use the state form instead, but it's still there for a reason. And the national form requires that you sign 
essentially an affidavit saying, under penalty of perjury, that you are in fact who you say you are, and that you are in fact a citizen of the United States. And if it's not true, then they can come after you the same way they come after anybody else who perjures themselves. Well, here in the state of Kansas, the Secretary of State has decided that the federal form really isn't good enough. He doesn't care for it because you don't have to produce those citizenship documents that you otherwise do under Kansas law. At first, he tried to get the form changed by the federal government, and that didn't pan out. So instead, he has created two parallel systems of voter registration. And so if you fill out the federal form in Kansas, you get to vote in federal elections. You get to vote for United States Senator and United States Congressman, but nobody else. Only if you fill out the state form, you get to vote in school board elections and county elections and state elections and city elections. And to us, that's not only patently unconstitutional, it's not only a gross violation of the spirit of the American principles, it's not only brazenly illogical, it's just unfair. It creates two different systems of voter registration, it creates two parallel electorates, and it gives some people more of a voice in the political process than others. That's just not right, and it's why we're currently in litigation with Chris Kobach. <laughs> So those are really our concerns about this. We continue to remain vigilant. We're going to continue to stay abreast of the situation, and we're going to continue to try and defend voting rights uh, and the freedom to participate in the political process. So thank you very much again for having me. I'm going to start with uh, a couple of specific questions for people, but anyone that wants to can, can comment. And uh, Ade, uh, I'm going to start with you. and. Uh, you had talked about how your time spent trying to register people to vote would have been more productive if you didn't have to deal with all the issues of proof of citizenship, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, you mentioned how difficult that was. I was wondering if you had any feel for what percent of the people you tried to register, you never got registered at all because you never uh, overcame that barrier. Um, well, I did try repetitively to contact people, uh, but I had to turn in the voter registration pretty quickly. Um, so it was probably, uh, that's kind of a hard, the number numbers in front of me is a little bit hard, but I'd say about 20 to 30% of the people we tried to register weren't, um, didn't have all their paperwork. It's probably, yeah, 30. And then after all my attempts, I probably went down to, 10 maybe, uh, and then afterwards it was, it was up to them. But really we tried very, very hard and we tried to have a quick turnaround process and they might have registered afterwards. But, um, and a lot of people who just didn't have their birth certificate on hand would start saying, oh yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then they'd be like, hey, I don't know, do I want to give you my birth certificate? Do I want to text it to this word number? <laughs> so I think it's kind of hard to, to give you a number of people who would have registered otherwise just because of all the steps that were involved. And for those of you that uh, are missing Stephen Colbert, your comments just reminded me about uh, people not necessarily wanting to share that information. If you, if you saw Leighton Colbert's, uh, I think in his last week, he had that yard sale of all his <laughs> paraphernalia, <laughs> memorabilia. And uh, I don't know if you remember on that segment, one gentleman came and wanted something and he wanted to play with the credit card. And at first Colbert said, no, cash only. And then he thought, oh, well, no, never mind. I'll write down your credit card number. And he wrote down the number. And he says, what's your security code? What's your social security number? You know, <laughs> and started asking all those personal questions. When you were talking about that, it made me think of that that, that particular gentleman was just telling Colbert all this stuff. <laughs> but all right, back to uh, serious business, though. Um, the um, a question here in, in support of this bill today for a straight party party line voting option. And I know our two election commissioners have had a chance to review this because it was just mentioned by Secretary Kobach today. But um, in whatever you can vision that, anyway, he, Secretary Kobach spoke to voter participation 
trailing off as you get further down the ballot. So I assume that means that, that people don't fill in as many off votes for offices further down the ballot. Um, could you speak to whether or not either of your offices have noticed that as a trend in voting? I had a meeting with the mayor today, and that was one of the things that we talked about, is the prospect of, if they change elections, they have a multi-page ballots. In the November 2014 election, we had a ballot that was front and back. The front side got voted, because that had people being elected to office. The back side was all those judges that were retention questions. And the further down the ballot you went, the fewer people that bothered to vote, because they figured out what it was, and they quite frankly said, I don't care. <laughs> Unfortunately, what that means is, and, and it's, it goes to the, the issue of local elections, is when you have the attitude that local politics doesn't matter, but national politics does, then you, you run the risk of, even if you put everything on the same ballot, you run the risk of people just saying, no, I don't care about that, and then and just flat not voting it, because the history is there with what people do with the judge candidates. There is something called ballot fatigue, that's the phrase, where it should go down ballot, you don't vote. And I don't know that I personally have an opinion about this straight party thing. We do have voters who call us and ask us that because they travel, they've been living in other communities and they are used to that. We generally will have a question come up from our county commissioners when they notice that there are much fewer votes for their, in their races than there were for the U.S. Senate, and we have to politely say no one cared about your race. <laughs> and that, that is a real thing, and whether this is a, a way to, to deal with any of that, I, I don't know. There are some concerns coming up on several of these about uh, fall elections and the consequences. Now, um, Brian, you mentioned that, that there might be some benefit if we kind of trained everybody to vote in the fall in the, in the off years so we might get higher participation in the, in the, in the uh, even years. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the questions was dealing with uh, whether or not that, that, that having a school board, they specifically talked about school board, but having school board elections in the fall coupled with, with the other uh, general elections might um, tend to be concerned because school board elections are nonpartisan and that, and that we might get some uh, partisan creep into, into school board elections. And another question asked about um, uh, something about whether, it, whether having school board elections in the fall would, would save money in terms of, uh, I suppose, the election budget. Well, there's two ways that that has been looked at. One is moving the spring elections in odd years back to fall of even years. That would be bad. That would cost us a lot more money. That would require the two-page ballot that Bruce talked about. That would require a lot more overtime, a lot more staff. Moving the spring elections in an odd year to the fall of an odd year, in my mind, good. Load balance, probably cost the same. But the number one thing here is that it is hard, I mentioned earlier about how hard it is to be electoral. It's hard to be a voter, you know? And uh, we had a whole theme last year called the Year of the Voter. I like Chinese food, a lot of Chinese, that should be a Year of the Voter. And the whole idea is that, and you see this little picture on the things I handed out, this concierge. We should be a voter of concierge. My opinion is, Truthfully, I don't care if you vote. If you are inclined to vote, I want to make it as easy as possible for you to vote. The reason I would say I wouldn't care is because I don't want to do anything to target a specific type of uh, demographic that might somehow influence an election unknowingly. But I want you to vote in general, and if you are inclined to vote, I want it to be as easy as possible. And right now, it's really hard because it's hard to find polling places. And I like the November thing because it, I think that we can get the schools on board to have a predictable polling place because pretty soon we're not going to have very many polling places. It's hard to get advanced voting sites. It's going to be harder as the economy gets better and storefronts are less available. The mail's terrible. We're running out of ways to vote. And so to me, that's why I like the November. You brought up school board elections. School board elections for me in Wyandotte County, uh, they're nonpartisan. But so is the election for every unified government commissioner. So is the election for mayor. So is the election for sheriff and register of deeds and KCK Community College Board of Trustees 
and the Board of Public Utilities, all of those are nonpartisan. The government is set up so that the incumbent, the, the new per person newly voted in, takes office at a particular time of year. Moving the elections to the fall of the year would change that schedule and obviously would change the <coughs> charter under which the unified government is organized. The same problem with school boards. What's the academic year? It starts in September and it goes to June. So how are the, the school boards have, have opposed this on the grounds that they want a school board for the entire school year. If you have an election in November, that potentially changes the makeup of that school board and you have either a new school board coming into effect first January or you tell that person that just got elected they can't, can't take office until next July. Well, how's that work? Needless to say, there's a lot of details that need, need to be worked out because the proposals run to making everything partisan or leaving some things alone, like school board elections. And I would argue that it, you know, it's a function of what works best for the governmental jurisdictions that are involved. The, uh, and that's the challenge that the legislature has, is finding a solution that uh, it isn't a one-size-fits-all. And, and I think dictating a one-size-fits-all is problematic, but again, that can happen. The issue for us as election commissioners or as county election officers, we don't get to decide what the rules are. That's decided for us by the legislature and the governor. We don't get to decide that at all. The proposals that were talked about today are proposals that's a legislative agenda for the Secretary of State. There is no guarantee that, that any of that will be enacted in the law. The Secretary of State before has tried to get prosecuted, prosecutorial authority and was unsuccessful. Whether or not the legislature is amenable to that this, this go around, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But the fact is, we can't deal with the what is. We have to, as election, county election officers, we have to deal with the what is. And that's what we do. We have several questions here um, dealing with uh, proof of citizenship, uh, that particular issue. Um, and the first one, and we'll just start here, says, isn't the proof of citizenship law biased against women who have to provide additional documentation um, and that, uh, for instance, their name is not identifiable using state birth records? And similarly, um, uh, well, no, that's a, a different one. And then, then there's one that's uh, on the same token, but uh, is there any idea in Wyandotte County what might help or in any county, what might help Hispanic women get registered? I mean, I think I would absolutely agree that uh, the proof of citizenship and proof of identification requirement is onerous for many different categories of people, including women, including immigrants, including senior citizens, including economically disadvantaged people. I mean, I think the list goes on and on. You could probably draw a smaller subset of people for whom it is not onerous and not discriminatory than you could for those that, that don't have a problem with it. Uh, there are some people for whom it is easier, and that's, that's great, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for them. Uh, but in general, I think it's very clear that it is a discriminatory tool, uh, and one that really helps more to set up obstacles than to achieve anything uh, really effective or needed. Uh, I think one important point to make here is, of course, that one reason for this proof of citizenship uh, registration requirement is that the uh, Secretary of State and others are concerned about non-citizens uh, voting. Um, and so the Secretary of State's office created this very sophisticated, very uh, impressive, really, uh, database that allows them to sort of counter check uh, whether someone is potentially a non-citizen or not using driver's license, uh, records and all sorts of other database searches. Um, and on the basis of uh, their own analysis, there were 24,000 registrations statewide that were suspended uh, at one point. That means the registration didn't go through because they were waiting on some sort of citizenship documents to be provided. So 24,000 of those statewide. By the Secretary of State's office own analysis, they were only able to find 20 people in the entire state who were potentially non-citizens who had registered to vote. And even some of those they later found actually were citizens, it's just the database search they had done was out of date. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a solution in search of a problem on top of being uh, discriminatory and unconstitutional. 
I do think from our election training that photo ID has more of an impact on women that that's what we would see. I don't know that I can speak to the citizenship. I see that. I mean, I can see the concept. I see the issue there. But uh, with photo ID, we know that women will have, as we will say, training. They have different names at different times. And you might have an ID that may not have a hyphenated name. It may have a hyphenated name. It may have a maiden name. And I do see that a lot. I mean, I, that's just an observation. But I can say also that in November, we only had 35 people cast a ballot uh, provisionally because they didn't have photo ID. So photo ID seems to be something that's here. Now, citizenship, I, you know, I, I can only, I guess, listen and observe, and I don't know that I have a strong opinion. I would say on both of these things, though, I mean, it, and I get it, OK? I get, I get the whole thing. I'm appointed by Secretary of State. I've been appointed by three different Secretaries of State. So while I've been appointed by Chris Kobach, I've also been appointed by Chris Biggs. I've been appointed by Ron Thorburn. I like them all. But I get that some people may not. Okay? And, I, but I, and I would understand the photo ID and the citizenship thing. But he wrote the bills. The legislature passed them. They were signed into law by the governor. So you could make a fair case that this is what people of Kansas wanted. I mean, that people who were involved were reelected. So I get the, I get it all, and I don't want to really defend any of that, other than just to make an observation when you pull back that that it doesn't seem as onerous always to everybody. I mean, that has to be understood. Quick comment, uh, and not to repeat what he said, but if this is biased toward anybody, or if anyone is being kept, kept from registering to vote because of a lack of proof of citizenship, there is a mechanism. And not one to this state has darkened my door and said, help. I'm willing to help anybody, to help them come up with the documentation that's necessary, and if they don't have a birth certificate, if they don't have a marriage certificate, they can present what they have, and that is presented to the state election board. The state election board considers the evidence that's established. The state election board has only had to rule on one, and they approve that. So I want to know where all these people are that are having problems. I know that we have a number of people, and I gave the statistic 1.6% of all of, of my registered voters. There's only 1.6% that's not registered because of proof of citizenship. 1.6%. And at the same time, while we're having all this angst over that 1.6%, and I understand the angst, trust me, but we've got anywhere from 60 to 90% of our registered voters who choose not to vote. That's outrageous. Where are they? I have always argued with our campaigns that are done there in Wyandotte County that they ought to be going door to door getting people to commit to vote. <coughs> Just commit to vote. Turn out the voters. If they encounter somebody while they're doing this that isn't registered, then by all means, register them. Fill out the voter registration application. Get it to us. One of the comments that was made earlier was the issue over um, all, the, all the resources that are expended on, on coming up with the proof. That's not the job of a campaign. The job of the campaign to go out and do voter registration is to have people fill out that voter registration application. It's our responsibility as an official government body to communicate with that applicant and say, this is what we need. And I understand that a lot of, a lot of applicants are not comfortable handing over their birth certificate to whoever happens to be knocking on their door. But when they're dealing with a governmental office that has to have it to be able to establish their citizenship, I don't see that there's that many people that, I, that have a problem. The issue for us is they just don't want to do it. But I understand that too because when you've got 60 to 90 percent that choose not to vote, hello. Um, I can mostly speak about the people I encounter and the people my volunteers encounter and registering uh, in the precincts that we, we visited. Uh, 
just to make sure uh, we're, I'm not with a campaign. We just try to help people register to vote regardless of political party um, to make sure that they know what the elections are and so forth. Uh, I, I mean, as far as general big numbers, I, I don't think I, I don't think those are something I can speak about as much as I can speak about those personal stories that I encountered at the doors. Uh, we had, um, I mean, I specifically remember uh, one woman who had had a bad husband and she moved out and then she had no idea where her, where her paperwork was and she was like, I went to register, but I, I mean, what, what do I do? And we did help her. We did go through the through a lot of, of trouble and we ended up, and she also didn't have a car, so we had to go back to her house and help her get the paperwork to the elections office because it, like the, the deadline was very close. Um, and uh, we also, we also had um, a, a, a couple of students who had just moved into town and they didn't have it and were waiting on their parents to send it because they were uh, they were UMKC students. And they were like, well, I don't know, my, my mom has to send it to me and then I have to send it in. And that was a long process. And what we ended up doing is just turn in the application and let them take care of the rest because it has to be turned in in a timely manner. Uh, but uh, I don't, I mean, I guess I could follow up with them and see if they ever finish the process. Uh, but I, I have registered people in past elections. And I had, in past elections, one volunteer might be able to come back with 10, 12 voter registrations per hour because there might be people in the home that also wanted to register and so forth. This time, one volunteer might have been able to come back with three per hour, if that many, sometimes two or one. Um, and uh, I, that's, that's really the numbers I have. I'm sure that, um, that there, there are others, and it might not be a sample big enough to make a difference, but that was my experience. I'm gonna ask, a, a, take a little prerogative here from the floor uh, and ask some follow-ups that I, I'm interested in. Uh, and, I, and I wonder, while we're on this issue of, of uh, voter registration. Um, somewhat my questions are from my background in education and, and uh, we used to tout, you know, 80% uh, of our students do this or that, 90% go to, to uh, college, etc. But what we frequently overlooked was, well, what about the person that was the parent of the kid that wasn't in the 80% or the 90%, etc. So I can appreciate when we say only 1.6% of our uh, registrations were incomplete. Um, and I'm not sure, I know, uh, Ryan, you said there were 300 and some thousand in Johnson County. I don't know how many registered voters we have in, in Wyandotte County. 84,000. 84,000. So, so that's 840, well, almost one and a half. So it's, it's a little over 1,000, 1,200, 1,400. Okay, 1,400 uh, voters. Uh, so it's, it is an issue to those people, whether they get to vote. Um, so uh, the, I guess the, the question is, uh, you know, kind of along, and if we put it in a statewide perspective, uh, so we got 20 some thousand people, you know, um, is that, is this an issue uh, that, that affects turnout, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna phrase my final charge to you two, and then you guys can respond, but, but um, how many of the incompletely registered voters in your county successfully voted in the state elections? Or for that matter, if you know, how many bothered to vote it off? If, if they'd heard from you that they were in, you know, incompletely registered, did we have any kind of turnout difference between those people's voting turnout and the general public's voting turnout? Well, for us, it's really hard to measure because the number keeps growing. So the breakdown, in my opinion, on where this falls apart is we get about 300 per month from the DMV, people register. It's called the DMV, but it's really your driver's license. You're registering, it asks you to upload your proof of citizenship, and the voter is like, I don't, I don't have enough. <coughs> what's, what's that? They all figure it out, and then they don't upload it, 
and, and they're in this category that is called pending or suspense. We send letters, we call them once a month, the robocall. Whenever we do talk to them, we almost get some sort of, eh, okay. It's really weird. You'd think that they would be very adamant. And if you look at that number, uh, I can only say that a small number of them voted in November. I just don't have the exact number. I can find out. But it would, it would, and so for us, it was 4,500 or so we had in that category. And I think we had fewer than 50 who tried to vote in November. One of the things, too, though, is because of the way the registration law is, is that some of them, I mean, this has gone on for a couple years now, some of those people have moved. They don't live in Johnson County anymore. We can't remove them. The only way we can remove them is if, and this is a stretch actually based on the law, is we send them a piece of mail that comes back returned undeliverable, and then if they don't vote in two November elections, then we can remove them. So somebody, might, we, we did an analysis of that, and about 10% of our list are people who don't really even live there anymore. So that's even another aspect. It's just, there's a lot of weird things about this, um, not the least of which is the people who we talk to don't really care that they're not registered. Another comment that I would make is that a lot of people make that proof of citizenship requirement, if they have it, way too complicated. It really is as simple as take out your cell phone, take a picture, email me the picture, and we're good. Because all I have to do is have a copy of your birth certificate or a copy of whatever your proof document is. People are thinking they have to get certified copies of their birth certificate. Well, where did that come from? All we want is a copy. And that copy, like I say, is as simple as take a picture of it with your iPhone. Um, the, 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 the statistics on turn turnout of incompletes. Um, Roughly 1,400 incompletes. Just 30 of them voted. The split uh, where uh, Secretary Hobach decided that if you filled out the federal form, unless you had proven citizenship, you couldn't, it, your ballot would not count for local offices, but it would count for U.S. Senator. Uh, all counted except six. That's it. Six. Six people out of all the federal applicants. So again, uh, it, uh, the numbers are small enough to me that I think the, the anguish ought to be over these huge numbers of voters that don't vote. I've got a spring election coming up on March 3rd, which is the primary. And I expect my turnout in Wyandotte County is going to be about 6%. That means 94% of all registered voters won't even bother. A similar statistic happens in the April election, which is now April 7th of this year, and I have an expectation that about 20% of my voters will bother to show up. That means 80% of registered voters aren't voted, and why not? The, they're, they're not? the candidates aren't capturing the attention of the voter, and if the voter's attitude is they don't care, then why don't they care? What are we doing about helping the voter to care? Many times what I hear from voters is, well, I don't know these people. Well, why not? Why aren't we doing voter forums? Why aren't we educating the public on who the candidates are? Letting the candidates talk to groups. And I mean not just having one meeting at KCK Community College. I'm talking about going around to every community group in all of Wyandotte County and talking to the people. That's not being done. I can't go out and represent those candidates. The candidates are the only ones who can represent themselves, but the candidates are unwilling to do the job. We've had two uh, UG commissioners over, uh, defeated, in other words, they didn't get reelected, because their opponent actually went out in a community <coughs> campaign. They lost because they didn't bother because they didn't think it mattered. Well, again, if the candidate is interested in being elected, the voters are interested in electing them but the candidate has got to do the job. All we can do from an election administration standpoint is notify people when the elections are, notify them when they can come to vote. So I think there are two important points to make here. The first is probably an unpopular thing for me to say. That's okay. Um, I may say you were used to it. Um, <laughs> which is that it frankly doesn't matter to me one whit whether anybody is affected in a practical sense 
by the voter registration law. I'm very happy to know that a very small number of people have actually been impacted, and I'm very happy to know that the logistics and the mechanics of it are actually working uh, really as good as we could possibly hope for. And so I certainly applaud the Election Commission's further work in doing that because I know it is definitely a thankless job. Uh, but my concern is not about the logistics. My concern is not about the numbers. My concern is about what it says about us as a people and as a country when we make it more complicated than we need to, when we put up obstacles to registration, and when we really essentially deny the fundamental human dignity that we say comes with the right to vote and that's embedded in the Constitution. So even if not one person is impacted, it is the principle and what it says about us and what it says about our democracy that concerns me. The second point that I'd like to make is that I'm also very um, concerned and worried about the low level of voter turnout. Uh, it's, it shouldn't be a concern to everyone. It should be something that we're all working on. But at the same time, it's important for us to remember that although we have the right to vote, we also have the right not to vote. And sometimes choosing not to vote, choosing to exercise the right not to vote, is itself a political statement. Sometimes it's not just pure apathy. Sometimes it's not just pure laziness. Sometimes it's not lack of information. It's that you just don't like the folks on the ballot and you can't see yourself vote for either one of them. <laughs> and we need to respect that and value that as part of our political discourse and as part of our democracy too. It wouldn't be my preference. It wouldn't be what I would encourage people to do. But if they make that choice, then we ought to value that and respect that and see that that means that we have more serious issues as a democracy and as a political process that we need to confront. So the, the, this next uh, question covers several peoples out there. there. There were a variety of people, and basically all of their entreaties are around, uh, so what can we do? Now, Bruce, you mentioned one approach, but I'm asking all four of you uh, if you have ideas on how we can uh, increase voter turnout. And you can talk about one county, or you can talk about uh, your ideas in general. Ideas on how to increase voter participation, like in general, like in the, the perfect world. <laughs> I think it, um, the state of Washington has mailing ballots for everyone. Everyone just votes by mail. They have a very, they have a very, very good voter participation percentage. So I think voter by mail would be one way to make sure as many people as possible would. Uh, would vote just because that's what um, we've seen in other states. Uh, in not a perfect world, um, I mean, here in Kansas, I think uh, at the with with some of the volunteers that were helping out uh, at the office, we used to joke about how we needed to have uh, kind of like voter navigators uh, for healthcare when. For people who don't have insurance or don't know how the system works, we have healthcare navigators that help them understand how to get a surgery when they don't have insurance. Uh, and they connect them to the necessary resources because they don't get that help from their doctors. So uh, it's been, since it was kind of difficult to navigate the system and make sure everyone had all the proper forms and uh, had the right to the elections office or the stamp to send, the extra documentation and so forth. We joke that we needed voter navigators, so people that wanted to register could had a place to go to and that could tell them all the forms that were available and that they might need to in order to be fully registered to vote. Um, other than that, at least uh, making it a little bit more accessible without uh, so many uh, without so many. Uh, obstacles in order to register. I mean, just one of them could make a difference, I think. Uh, just not having to fill out that extra form after you filled out another one already would, would make a huge difference. And uh, something that, that Mike had mentioned earlier that I, I forgot to follow up on is um, this idea that non-citizens want to, uh, would register to vote. Something that people don't realize and that we experience when we're at the doors and every day is that uh, if a non-citizen is to is, is to vote, 
they are risking not ever seeing their family again because pretending to be a citizen is one of the most punishable things you can do with immigration. Uh, so if you are to <coughs> vote, you could potentially never, you know, if they, you're to vote, and, uh, then try to reapply for your permit or get a citizenship, and they find out that you did, you might be barred for life. That's, that's a big risk to take. <laughs> so um, I think people in general that, I, that we saw were very, very cautious of not, not doing something that would keep them away from being with their family for the rest of their lives. I had so many thoughts. Campaigns sometimes go out and they want to, they're in their zeal to get people registered. They kind of ignore that question, are you a citizen? And so they signed people up, and we had a handful of people this year that called us up and said, cancel my registration. I'm not a citizen. And I made a big mistake when I signed that form and said I was. And maybe they're going through the citizenship process and just now figured that out. But the, the, the obvious problem is when you have really zealous campaign workers that are adamant about registering anybody and everybody they come into contact with, that can be problematic for, for people who are not citizens because it does get them in trouble. And we shouldn't be doing that. Um, you know, obviously there are a number of things that can be done. I was thinking of, you know, the vote by mail. Uh, when you do vote by mail, it's considered to be one of the least secure methods of voting, but it's certainly more secure than voting on the internet. But if you want to be totally outrageous, why aren't we voting by email? Why aren't we voting by on the internet? Well. It's that issue of ballot security. So there's a balance between what is a secure method of voting. In other words, all the votes that are cast actually get counted, and you don't have somebody uh, salting the well to make it appear that more, a person got more votes than they really did. Um, so there's lots of things that, that get, need to get balanced there. I've had, over the last nine years that I've been the election commissioner, I've made several overtures to the four school districts in my county to try and educate kids that are in their, in their senior year. I remember the government class one I had with, that I had when I was a senior. There isn't any school district that would uh, let us come into the school to teach students how to vote. I've had better success at the school for the blind, because again, that's not very many people, but we've gone over to the school for the blind the device that they use is the uh, touch screen. And they are delighted because we take it over there and we let them practice on it for three weeks before the election. They love it. It's those kinds of things that need to be done to help people learn how to vote. Citizenship classes. I got an inquiry from Kansas City, Kansas Community College saying, can you come out and teach a class to the people that are going through the citizenship classes? And I said, absolutely, tell me when and where. They never called me back. I tried to contact the instructor that contacted me, and she never called me back. So even when you pursue things, sometimes it doesn't work. <coughs> now, one of the things that my colleague mentioned earlier is that continuing to do elections at polling place, places can be problematic, because on election day, voters are required to go to their polling place. They can't go any place that they want. But there is a concept called vote centers, and that concept is done in, in some other states, but the vote center, and that's the way we do advanced voting, by the way. The vote center is you can go to any one of the vote centers and vote any ballot, any ballot. It isn't limited to just your precincts, the, the precinct where your ballot is. You can go anywhere. I already have a substantial, in fact, more than half of my provisional ballots in, in the last several elections have been cast by voters who simply went to the wrong precinct. That's simple. We tabulate votes by precinct. If we were operating on the basis of vote centers, and I'm not saying a vote center just on election day. I'm saying a vote center that operates the entire two and a half week period of, of advanced voting and on election day, and gives voters the opportunity to choose your date and choose your time, come whenever you want. Now there's gonna be some voter education involved in that, because the voter education has to be, you can't wait till election day to come vote, because then, then there's gonna be huge lines. But if you choose a time during that two and a half week period to come vote, yeah, you can vote. And it'll be in and out, and you'll be done. And you can vote any ballot in the county. That's the way my satellite voting center is set up on the Kansas Speedway, and that's certainly the way we're set up at the election office. Uh, 
Running polling places is problematic because we got we have a substantial number of election workers. My colleague referred to that. It's this generation that sit in this room that are, that are traditionally the ones that have volunteered to be election workers. You're dying off. <laughs> I'm dying off. What happens when we're gone? If the younger folks aren't willing to volunteer to be election workers, it is already getting difficult to find sufficient numbers of election workers. If the younger generation is not willing to volunteer, and I'm not saying we pay big bucks. Uh, in Wyandotte County, we've been paying $100 for the day. Well, you do the math. That's less than minimum wage. I succeeded in changing that this last year, and election workers are paid above minimum wage. Above minimum wage. We've tied it to a unified government pay scale. That's, that's how I plan to keep it above pay scale in perpetuity. But the issue is you've got to pay election workers to, to staff, whether it's 30 polling places or 90 polling places or 200 polling places, you not only have to have the facilities to go to that are ADA compliant, and you have to have election workers to staff them. So I'm constantly being asked, well, why did you close my polling place? Because the facility doesn't want us there anymore. And I can't get election workers to staff the place anyway. So I've had to reduce. The Department of Justice came to Wyandotte County four years ago and did a ADA compliance inspection, inspection on the county. And it, was the, it wasn't just the election places, it was the entire county, all the unified government buildings. There were several of my polling places which were unified government buildings that were not ADA compliant. I shut them down as polling places because state law says I can't use it as a polling place if it's not Americans with Disabilities Act compliant. It has to be ADA compliant. You wouldn't believe the fear that that caused. How dare you close my polling place? Well, I didn't close it. The Department of Justice closed it. First and, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> we could go on all night. <laughs> passes. So in terms of voter turnout, we could have fewer elections. We have six a year, at least in the time I've been here in the last 10 years. We already had five this year, we had at these school elections. Of the 60 we had in the first 10 years of my time, half of them were unscheduled. They were special elections, costing taxpayers money, and also diluting the times that people were out thinking about voting. We used to see mail ballot election turnout with 50% plus. And then the turnout has began with a four. We're not so certain that this school election combined the turnout won't begin with a three. So one thing to do is to have fewer elections. I also believe that voters get a bad rap. I mean, okay, voters aren't coming out, but I believe that compelling candidates, compelling races, get voters to come out. So have better candidates. Have them come out and, and convince voters why they ought to vote for them. There are certain things we can do, perhaps. Voting by mail would be one. Not convinced of that because the Postal Service has its own issues. But in the end, uh, I, you know, again, I, we just keep coming back to the compelling races, compelling candidates. That will drive out voters. And I think I would agree with just about everything that's been said. Uh, I think any of them uh, would probably uh, work and do something. Uh, I think mail-in ballots may be a good idea. I think Saturday voting, you know, moving election day from Tuesday to Saturday could be a good idea. Declaring uh, election day a national holiday has been suggested in the past. Uh, I think obviously reducing the obstacles, whatever those may be, uh, does the trick. I think we definitely right now have a culture in this country uh, of sort of aggressively trying to raise the obstacles, raise the barriers, and I think that sinks in with people too over the long run. And I think that influences turnout, so I think we need to stop that. Um, and I would definitely agree that, that it's also about who's on the ballot and what's going on. If people feel engaged, if people feel that it matters, if people think that it's going to accomplish something, then they're more likely to participate than not. Um, so we, we have to create a culture of voting and create a culture of participation uh, that without it will continue to see decline. Okay, I, I don't have too many more questions. Uh, but I'm going to try to uh, uh, ask you to limit your answers so I actually have five more here. And I'm going to combine one of them, actually, so we'll just say four more. And these are two specific things, and, and uh, I just thought I'd, I'd read them. You don't necessarily have to comment on these specific things, 
uh, other than I'm making you aware of a comment that's come up here, but if you want to comment, you can. But one says that uh, um, they have some friends in Wyandotte County who don't necessarily think that the elections in their part of Kansas City, Kansas, are, are fair where they live. And it doesn't say why they don't think they're fair. And, and so if you feel unable to comment, that's fine, but if you want to. And related to that is another one that talks about uh, a friend was, uh, so these are anecdotal things, but a friend was given a provisional ballot because her signature on her application for requesting a ballot didn't match her signature on other documentation. And uh, in any case, uh, if, if I understand it correctly without reading the whole other thing, that uh, after communicating all of this, um, it, it didn't get resolved in time for this person to vote. The, the second comment about voter signature not matching, matching, that person in fact voted a, a ballot. It came back to us as a provisional ballot, uh, and it probably because it was because of a change of address or something else. It was, it was considered a, a provisional ballot. When the signature does not match and it's a mail ballot, we don't know whether the voter voted that ballot or not. It could have been a family member. Most of the time, we're able to find in the voter record either a signature that matches or we're able to find a family member's signature who sure matches. <laughs> family members can't vote your ballot. Only you can. So we then immediately call the voter and say, your ballot's provisional. We need you to come down to the election office and give us a new signature card so that we have a signature from you that matches, that, that matches the signature on the ballot and it also matches the signature that we're going to have for you in the voter registration system. Then we'll show up. Most of the people we call, I think in the last election we had three people that came and rectified their provisional ballot because of the signature issue. They're not, they're not interested in uh, coming down. Now part of the issue is if the election came out the way they wanted it to come out anyway, why bother? And that happens a lot. Now, the elections come out the way they want, obviously, I know this election statewide didn't come out the way that certain people wanted, but my county is 40% Democratic. So there were things that came out exactly the way they wanted it, and there are certain, thing, certain things that don't come out the way they wanted it. But um, As far as the election's not fair, I'd love to know where that is. Because uh, we have, the Unified Government had a study done in the community by an independent group and every one of the departments was evaluated. And we are the only department, other than the sheriff's office, that got an exceeded expectations. Every other department in UG uh, did not meet or, you know, they, they fell in a different place on the chart, but, but we're the only, the only office other than the sheriff's office that wound up exceeded expectations. So I'm proud of that, but I sure would like to know where there's, uh, there's uh, dissatisfaction because that's, we endeavor to make sure that every election is dead bad fair. If it's not, I want to know why. Maybe they'll come up and ask. Yeah, them. please. Um, I'm going to just, uh, so that everybody's, I, I can say I've covered everyone's question. I'm going to just read these three things, and anybody that wants to comment can, but we are just about in need of final comments and a journey. Um, one is, is just a general question. Uh, how do we know that our votes are actually counting? Is there an independent oversight committee. Another one was, uh, what do you think about the push uh, by some people for uh, making school board and municipal elections partisan? And uh, another one which says that, uh, is it possible that voting styles and patterns and habits of Johnson and Wyandotte County are not representative of other parts of the state? Um, uh, and that even if we are not having issues, in your opinion, uh, perhaps they are. So if anyone would like to comment on any one of those, but please, quickly. I'll just address the last one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do we know that votes are counted? There is a public test that we conduct before an election which demonstrate that the tabulation system is working properly. And we do conduct post-election audits, and we do a post-election uh, public test as well, or not really a public test, but another test that we put the same way. So that would be the best way that we, I could say, demonstrate the number, we track how many people are voting, and 
same number of votes, so that's a good thing. Uh, I know you all need to comment because I'll take up too much time, but <laughs> um, votes counted. There's observers. Candidates, political parties, there are a certain set of individuals who are allowed to be observers in a polling place. We have a substantial number of people that sign up to be an observer. Uh, that's not only in the polling place, they can also come to the election office. We normally have media present in our office who observe the counting of the votes. Now, when you're talking about the counting of the votes in the election office, the ballots have already been tabulated at the precincts, so that's why we have observers there. At the election office, all we're doing is uploading an electronic file. So, uh, if you can see that, your, your eyesight's better than mine, because I can't see computer, the internal workings of the computer. Um, we also have uh, voters that, I mean, observers at the canvas, and the canvas is when all the available ballots are considered. And anybody, because it's a public meeting, can attend that. And you can see exactly what ballots are counted, and which ones are not, and why. Um, voting habits and patterns, I, I don't know, because I don't, I'm not across the state. I'm concerned about my county. Let's have a big round of applause for all of you. Executive Director Brandy Fisher for a few final comments. Okay, well, thank you all for being here tonight and giving your evening. Thank you to the panel. It was great to have you. Um, great to welcome you, Mike, on board with uh, our partner, Basil Yu. Um, thank you to the committee and uh, Charlotte, who's the program committee chair, and the whole committee, and Lisa Patterson Kenzie, who staffs that committee here for moderating. It's just Mainstream is a, a membership organization, and so all the work other is mostly volunteers making this. <coughs> Thank you for being there. Um, so a couple of things: we uh, mainstream has really grown in the last year. In the last year, we doubled our network. So our network of folks that are getting our emails and on social media and getting our mailings went from 3,000 to 6,000. So while we think that's great, it was a, a strong year. We know that that's just like a scratch of where we need to be and that um, we need to double again this year and the next year so that we can really be impacting the political climate in Kansas. So we'll be doing that through our weekly email updates and uh, legislative updates and action alerts and through these forums. Tonight is the first time um, at the request of some mainstream members from around the state that we are um, not just videoing our forum uh, so that folks can watch it later, but actually have been having a live feed. So we did tonight as a trial. We had a handful of people from around the state watch tonight and actually send in a couple of questions, but um, we're really going to make it possible that groups can come together all over the state and be connected while we have these forms. Um, our next forum is on education. It's on February 19th. Uh, third Thursday of February, we will be back at Colonial Church because we're expecting a big crowd. Uh, for those of you that got to catch a bit of the Governor's State of the State address on your way over here in the car, or uh, maybe snuck peeks at your phone, if you're sitting in the back row, I know you were. Uh, <laughs> um, it seems like the general takeaway is that the Governor is full steam ahead, um, continuing towards the zero income tax, that school funding is the reason we have a budget problem, and it's because the formula has been flawed, which is why we've had uh, litigation over the past how many years. So that tells me that Mainstream and its partners have our work cut out for us. Oh, and uh, that we need to change not only what our elections are, but how we select Supreme Court justices. And I think the quote from, maybe it was Brian Lowry or one of the other reporters was that, uh, our Supreme Court selection process is the least democratic in the nation. <laughs> Merit selection is not so democratic, apparently. So we've got our work cut out for us, but we can't do it without you. And typically I ask you all to join, but I know most of you in the room are members. But what we really have to do is grow that network. And we need every person that's currently in our network to be an ambassador. I'm going to ask you to do four things. Well, do one of four things. Next month I'll ask you to do another one. Uh, if you're on email and you're not getting our emails, we send them every Friday, please sign up. You can sign up in the back. If you're getting our emails, Friday we do a 
synopsis, we send you some of the news stories, some calendar events, both of our events, but some of our partners' events, League of Women Voters and others that are having events. Um, we also will be now covering the legislative session and sending out updates every couple of weeks and action alerts. If you're getting those, and I hope you all are, um, forward those on. If each of you in this room committed to bringing 10 people in the fold, whether they join as members or just join the email list to get the email updates, that will help us grow our network because then we'll ask those to bring in 10. So make sure you're getting the updates. If you're getting them, forward them on to 10 people. You can say at the bottom, if you don't want these anymore, I'll stop forwarding. But if I don't hear from you, I'm going to keep forwarding. That's what I do with my friends. Um, if you're already doing both of those things, uh, we'll be testifying in Topeka. Last year we testified a dozen times. And uh, we would love to have any of you that have an issue that either you're interested in or an expert on, join us and testify. And we can help you uh, get your testimony into Topeka and help you figure out where you need to be. But uh, we want to help have as many moderate, rational, reasonable voices countering the crazy in Topeka. We will be sending action alerts. So we try to pick the times when we think it will be most impactful to send the alerts. Otherwise, we'd be sending them daily. Um, we already have three crafted, I guess, by the end of the state of the state address. Uh, please respond as you can to those action alerts, even if you're just making one or two phone calls. Um, and then finally, if those of you that are members in the room could raise your hand. So almost everyone, thank you for making this work possible, for being part of mainstream. If you didn't raise your hand, uh, there's people in the back that will help you sign up so that next month you can raise your hand as well. Let's see if I'm missing anything. Just a second. Too many. I had all my questions ready to get to turn in. Um, I think that's it. We'll see you in February on the 19th.